Hey, good morning, Crossroads. Great to see everybody inside, all you watching online. Glad you are with us. If you have your Bible, you can open up to Philippians chapter 4. Sometimes we teach through a whole book like we just did through 1 Peter. Sometimes we just dive into a particular passage, and we're going to spend four weeks on this passage from Philippians chapter 4. I want to tell you about something coming up, and that is we know Tuesday is a big day in our country, and I want to encourage everybody to pray and to vote, and uh, it, it's going to be um, a, an epic week, I'm sure, but I know that at the conclusion of whenever we find out who won, there's going to be some of us that are happy and some of us that are disappointed, and the reality is Jesus is still on the throne. And so, because of that… As we've been saying through this entire uh, past few months, uh, we want to continue to celebrate that. And so on November the 10th, which is a week from today, that Sunday evening, we're going to gather back together for a special time of prayer and worship and just celebrate who is really in charge and whose kingdom we're a part of and who we follow. And you're going to want to make sure you're back for that next Sunday night. Some of you are already trying to figure out when do the Cowboys play and all that. And and my first question is, why does it matter? The second thing... (laughs) is, I'm sorry, I'm, I told myself I'd be good. Um, they play in the afternoon, but we will start later than that, and then you'll have either much to celebrate or much to pray for. So we'll be back uh, Sunday night to deal with that, and, and that'll be a great time for us to respond to whatever happens uh, this week. So pray, vote, and then we'll praise God for what He's doing in this world, and that we get to be a part of His kingdom. Uh, today, I want to start off by asking, is there anything in your life that you kind of have a bad taste in your mouth about? Like, maybe it was a place that you ate, or maybe it was a movie you saw, or maybe it was a person that you met, and something happened, and you thought, eh, I don't really like that person. You know, I just, every time I think about them, I, I kind of, I feel bad, or it's just, you know, it's not good. I want to tell you, just, you know, in a moment of confession here, one of these particular people in my life, they're not not even in my life, but they impacted me. When I was a kid growing up in Kansas, we didn't have an NBA team for you to cheer for like you guys have here in Dallas. And so I opted for the one that was always on TV in the 80s, which was the Los Angeles Lakers. Don't hate me for it. I'm sorry, but that's just who I grew up with. I loved watching them play. And I was a big fan, and I was very excited when 1985, when they won uh, the NBA championship. In 1986, they were back in the playoffs. I thought, this is it. They're going to win it again. No one's repeated in 20 years. This is going to be awesome. And they were down three games to one to the Houston Rockets. And they were up by one point with one second left, the Lakers were. All they had to do was hold on for one second. They win the game. Now it's three to two. We're still in this thing. But then something horrific happened. We actually found this video on YouTube. Take a look at what happened. One second left, mind you. Here we go. Take a look at this. One second on the clock. was ruined at that moment. The Lakers had lost. I felt devastated, all because of one guy, a guy by the name of Ralph Sampson. And I made a vow that night. If I ever lock eyes, even though he's 7'4", with Ralph Sampson, I'm going to have words with him. Fast forward 25 years. I'm preaching at the church in California that I was at. I get done teaching, walk off the stage, walk out in the lobby just to say hi to some people, and I scan the room, and there, hovering above everybody, (laughs) Ralph Sampson. I thought, what are the odds? God has uniquely positioned me for such a time as this. This is incredible. And I walked up to him, and he was so nice. He said, hey, pastor, great sermon. It was good to meet you. And I said, well, (laughs) just a second. Hey, don't bring that first time guest thing over here just yet. I got got a beef with you, buddy. Oh, what's the problem? And I said, well, I'm still not over what you did to my Lakers in 1986. And he started laughing at me. He said, dude, you need to let it go, okay? I mean, we had that one already. Don't worry about it, you know? And I said, I know, I know, I know. But, you know, it was just, when the moment I saw him, it like all came back up, you know? Oh, there he is, you know? Now, maybe you don't have that with a, a sports figure. Maybe you do. Uh, but, but for a lot of us, it's, it's also food. Let me tell you something that just really kind of makes my stomach turn, and that is the Brussels sprout. Now, as soon as I say this, you're going to come up to me and say, but have you tried it with? Yes. Okay? And the answer is, I don't even care to try it, however, but what you got to do, whatever, as long as the Brussels sprout remains, I'm not interested. 
Now, if you deep fry it and do all this stuff, then remove the Brussels sprout and I eat what's left, that's fine. But I don't want anything to do with it. I don't care what your way is, not interested in it because it makes me nauseous just to see one. Here's the third one that might have a reaction for every single one of us, and that is the dollar bill. I mean, there are some of us, the moment we see one, we're like, oh, let me have one. Let me have one. Let me have, let me have some more. And there's some of us that are like, oh, I got one in my pocket, burning a hole in my pocket. I got to buy something right now. In fact, I should go on Amazon right now and buy something. And some of you right now are like, oh, I got to hold it. I got to hold it. I got to hold it. I got to store it up. Save it, save it, save it. All of us have different perspectives when it comes to the moment we see money. And it's something that often is just kind of within us. Did you know they say that uh, there's two kinds of people in the world, those who save and those who spend, and they usually marry each other. Okay? Have you noticed that in your home? I noticed that in my home when I was a kid. I had a mom that said, we can't afford it to everything. And we had, had a dad that said, just buy it. We'll figure out how to pay for it later. That created a lot of holy fellowship in our home between those two, right? And I even see it in my kids. Uh, years ago, my kids were young, like six and four, I think. And, and grandma took them to the mall. It was around Christmas time. And she gave each of them $5. You can spend it on whatever you want when we get to the mall. Okay, grandma. And they roll into the mall. And as they approach it, there's somebody out there with the bell, Salvation Army, right? And they walk up there, and my oldest daughter, Lindsay, she immediately walks up and takes her $5 bill and hands it to Salvation Army. And my grandma, or their grandma, my mom, looks at her and says, now you don't have to give all of that. Are you sure you want to do that? And she said, oh, I'm sure. So then grandma looks at my other daughter, Sydney, and says, do you want to do that too? And Sydney says, no, I'm good. <laughs> Not interested in that. I'm holding on to this, right? I mean, we see this all throughout our home, right? There are some of us that we just spend and some of us who just save and we just cannot understand each other and it creates all of this tension. And as a result, when we have opportunities to be generous, when you see that person on the street corner, when you have somebody that comes by your office and says, hey, my kid's raising money for band, when somebody shows up at your front door, when your church talks about an initiative like Heart for Harvest, there's something in every single one of us that goes, oh, I don't know if I can because I'm either saving or I'm using it on me and I don't have any margin to give. So we're going to spend the next four weeks just looking at what Scripture has to say about this idea of generosity. What, it, what does it mean for us to be generous? How much is it enough for us to even give? And at what point does God say, I love your faith and your generosity? And here's my promise to you. The things that we're going to talk about over these four weeks will not just impact your marriage, but it will impact your kids and it will even impact your pocketbook because you will have more peace, but you'll also have more money when you begin to apply these biblical principles. So let's just start with the big overarching question. Why are we even talking about this? Okay. I don't want to come to church and hear about money. And I got to be honest with you. I am nervous about this. And here's why. If you've been around this church for a long period of time, you used to have a pastor who led so well in teaching about this. Pastor Barry had a book out called ABCs of Financial Freedom. He taught about it in such a great way. We had him come out to our church in California and teach it two different times. And he's just incredible at it. And you hear me talk about it. You're like, eh, it's like a junior higher talking to doctoral candidates. I'm not so sure. So I'm nervous about that. But then some of you are like, well, I don't know that, but you're new, and I don't want you to think that all we're after is your money, because that's what everybody thinks the church is after, right? So let me just say from the beginning, I don't want something from you, I want something for you. Here's why we have to talk about it, because most of our problems can be traced back to money. One of the reasons couples get divorced, money. One of the greatest reasons of discontentment, depression, anxiety, money. Some of you are stressed about it right now because I just mentioned it. You got your mind on your money and your money on your mind, all right? You are just focused on it. I love that you got that, all right? And you're trying to figure out how do I teach this to my kids when we don't even have it figured out? Well, here's one of the reasons we're going to talk about it, because the Bible talks about this more than any other topic. In fact, there's over 2,300 verses in the Bible that talk about money. Two-thirds of Jesus' parables are about money. Money is mentioned more often than in the Bible than heaven, more often than salvation, more than Jesus, more than prayer, almost anything but the name of God. And the Bible says it's the church's responsibility to teach, to teach the full counsel of God and all that is said in Scripture. And we do that by either teaching Bible books or Bible passages. And so because of that, we've got to talk about money. And here's another reason why it talks so much about money. Because he, it knows how we can be enslaved to money. 
how it can destroy a marriage, how it can stress us out, how it can ruin our integrity, how it can pull us away from God. And that's why the Bible talks about it so much, because most of our problems in life can be traced back to money. Not just bills, not just debt, but emotional stress, and even below that, spiritual roadblocks. Some of you feel like, I just can't grow beyond where I am spiritually, and it may be because of how you're handling finances. Here's why. Jesus says that where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Now, we would think it'd be the opposite. Wherever you put your passion, then your money will follow. Isn't that what we say about when our kids go to college, you know? Now suddenly we're invested in that school. The reality is just the opposite. When we invest in something, our heart tends to follow it. If you put a lot of money into Apple a few years ago, your heart followed after it, and you are focused on it right now. And that's why we got to do a series on this to talk about it, because it has so much to do with more than just our bank account, but with where our heart is with God. So here's what we're going to do to provide help for everybody, because I recognize anytime we talk about this, there are some that are doing great and some that are really struggling. And so we recognize as a church, we're all over the map, so we want to help. We're going to offer... Again, this great course that we have called Money Life, where we just walk through basic money principles, how to get out of debt, how to save for retirement, how to put stuff away for kids' school, how to right-size your budget, give you someone to blame between you and your spouse when you're upset with each other. It's a great opportunity. That's coming up here at the first of the year. But we're even going to do a one-day event coming up in December, and I'm going to tell you more about that next week. But today, we're going to talk about four attitudes. Just four attitudes, that if you change your attitude about your finances in these four different ways, I guarantee it's going to change everything when it comes to your resources. And these all come from this passage that we're going to read from, written by the Apostle Paul. Paul writes about these in chapter 4 of Philippians, and this is basically a book that he has written or a letter that he wrote that we put in our New Testament, we call it this, this particular book of the Bible. But this letter was written to a group of people that were being taxed 40 to 50 to 60 percent of their income. They were struggling with their businesses because they were Christians. They were having to pay all kinds of fees in redoing their city because of an earthquake that had hit. And they were dealing with all kinds of poverty. Yet, when Paul went to do missionary trips, they begged him to take their money because they wanted to be generous to him. He writes this particular letter, and in this particular passage, he wants to thank them for their generosity. And in this particular passage, we're going to see four different attitudes that we need to have when it comes to generosity. Let's take a look at this. We're in Philippians chapter 4, verses 15 through 20. Here's what Paul writes. As you Philippians know, in the early days, your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia... Not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts, what I desire is more be credited to your account. Now think about that. What he's going to teach them means that their giving is credited to their account. There's a gift that they get as a result of this. We're going to talk about that next week. I've received full payment and have more than enough. I'm amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you've sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. Did you know when you give, it is an actual act of worship before God? We're going to talk about that in two weeks. And my God will meet all your needs. This is where some of you just woke up. Okay, now I'm interested in that. Okay, we're going to talk about that in three weeks. According to the riches of glory in Christ Jesus, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Here's what's interesting. In another letter that he writes to a group of people in a church in a town called Corinth, he says, I can't stop talking about these Philippians who gave because they begged me to give even though they had so little. And to these Philippians, he says, I can't believe you're being so generous. And here's why. Because they knew what a blessing generosity was to them. In other words, as many of you have already discovered, you can't outgive God. So we're going to walk through all of those in the weeks to come, but I want to tell you what we're going to talk about today. We're going to scroll back to verses 11 and 12. Here's what Paul says. I am not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. Now think about that for a second. 
How many times in the last week did you tell your teenager, just be happy with what you have? We had a saying in our house, you get what you get and you don't get upset. They still got upset. But you know what I mean. You try, right? We all want people in our life to just be happy with what they have. And you know what? That's what others want for us too. That's what God wants for you and for me. And Paul says, I've learned to be content. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. We want to know what that means. So in these passages we just read, there are four attitudes. We're going to call them this, giveitudes, when it comes to generosity. That if you learn these, you'll not only have peace about your resources, but you'll actually have more resources. And so we're going to drill in to this one particular idea as to what he's talking about today, and it has everything to do with giveitude number one, which is the giveitude of contentment. Everybody say contentment. All right. It's interesting that God mentions this attitude first in this chapter. In other words, to handle our money in a right way, we need to learn this secret of contentment. And most of us haven't. Most of us look at everything and we think, I just need more. I just need a little bit more. I mean, think about it. When you scroll through social media and you see somebody just got a new car and somebody just got a new house and somebody's on their third cruise of the year, do you ever think, good for them. I hope they get more. In fact, I have too much. I will help give them another car. No, you think, I want a car. I want that house. I want to go on a cruise. Because we tend to think about how we want more. I'll be generous when I make more, is the way we typically think. And so when people come to your door and say, hey, can you support band? Or you see the guy on the street corner, or there's a charity that sends you a letter in the mail, you think, oh, I wish I could. But I just can't right now. Because for some of us, we're saving, and for some of us, we're spending, but we just don't know how we can do it because we just need more. There's this magazine called Fast Company. It deals with businesses and best practices. It's pretty incredible, and now it's a, obviously a website. But they did this, uh, this study years ago where they asked people who were just, you know, working all the time, and these people were complaining about, I just need more time with my family, but I'm working so much in order to take care of my family. And so this is what they asked them. They said, would you rather have a $10,000 a year raise or an extra hour per day to spend at home with your family? You know where this is going, right? 83% said, I'll take the money, okay? I just want the money, because that'll make them happy, right? We just feel like we just got to have a little bit more. Now, here's what they discovered. Look at this quote. It says, the ultimate question that we were asking was, how much is enough? The ultimate answer appears to be that there is no such thing as enough. The more people have, the more they want. Enoughness is a moving target. The rich are no more able to achieve it than those who are less well off. In other words, they are on this relentless pursuit of it. Once I find it, then I'll be happy. It might be a dollar amount. It might be uh, being able to uh, retire at a certain age. It might be something that you buy. But there's this feeling that if you and I could just find it, it, then suddenly we would be happy. You know when I discovered what it was? 1977, when the Star Wars action figures came out. And I got three of them, but my friend down the street got eight of them. I just got to have those. Then I got those, then he got the Millennium Falcon. Oh my goodness, well now I got to have that. And then I was happy, and then he got the Death Star. Now I got to have that. You know, it just was never, ever ending. And then I realized what I needed was an Atari game system. This was going to change my life. You know, play Pong, you know? I mean, that's state of the art. That would be incredible. And you know what? I never got the Atari game system. And I haven't been happy since. (laughs) I'm still mad at my parents about that, you know? Anytime I open a gift, that's not an Atari, you know? Where was that? Because there's something in our mind, in your mind, that just feels like, I just need more. I just got to have it. And here's the reality for you and I both. We're never gonna get it. Maybe that ought to be our theme song. You're never gonna get it. (laughs) You're never gonna get it. My love, you're never gonna get it. (laughs) Don't, don't, don't clap, there'll be more, all right? (laughs) 
The reality is it's never enough. Now, they interviewed all these billionaires. They interviewed Ted Turner, and they said, tell us what it's like to be a billionaire. And he said, having, <laughs> having wealth is one of the most disappointing things anybody could ever experience. It's overrated. And you know what you and I are thinking? Let me try. Okay? Let me just give a go at it. I think I can make it happen. Andrew Carnegie, another wealthy man, said this, that millionaires who laugh are rare. And then a study was done by the University of Pennsylvania, and they just basically said this way, depression incre increases with possessions. The more stuff you have, more things you're worried about. So here comes the Apostle Paul, and he says, you know what? I think we just need to learn to be happy with what we have. And I know that's what you want. And that's what you're, you want your kids to learn. But the reality is most of us are so focused on what's next and what's it and how do we get it. And Paul says, let me give you give it to number one, and that is be content. And then he says, I have learned the secret to being content, which means it can be learned. So I'm going to tell you three ways that you can learn to be content. And you can start teaching this to your kids so they can learn to be content as well. Okay? Here's the first one. And that is you got to resist comparing. You have to resist comparing. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We do not dare classify or compare ourselves. It is not wise. Proverbs 14, verse 30 says, a heart of peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Most of us are just looking around at everybody else thinking, how do I get what they have? I just want it. There's this Aesop's fable that tells the story of a guy who was given the ability to get whatever he wished for with one caveat. Whatever he got, his neighbor would get twice as much. So he wanted a new house, he got a new house, but his neighbor got a bigger house. He wanted a new horse, he got a horse, his neighbor got two horses. He wanted a new wardrobe, he got new clothes, his neighbor got twice as many clothes. And then finally one day he came up with this idea, I wish I were half dead. <laughs> you think about it, but we wrestle with that, right? I mean, many of our financial problems and our unwillingness to be generous to other people and to God are rooted in this comparison trap. I love what Rick Warren says. We buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't even like. And most of us are stuck in that comparison game, so stop looking around. Here's the second thing. Rejoice in what I do have. It's funny, when we compare people who have more than us, we always feel so less than them. And we eye the riches and possessions of others, and we look at what they have, and we think it could be better. But what if we had a different thing that we thought about? What if we simply said, it could be worse? Can we practice that together? Let's all say that. It could be worse. Let's say it like we actually mean it, okay? It could be worse. Let me just play this out for you. Let's say you leave here today, and you go out to your car, and you drive away, and you know, that old car that you have that you're kind of, you know, piecing together with duct tape and prayer, just trying to hope that it keeps going, and you, you pull up, you know, to the stoplight after you leave, and up next to you pulls one of those brand new Tesla Cyber Trucks, right? I mean, you think it looks goofy, but you're kind of thinking, I kind of like to have one, you know? I mean, it looks pretty cool, right? And so it pulls up next to you, and you're looking at it, and you're listening to your car kind of shake, rattle, and roll, and you're looking at that car, and you're looking at your car. I want you just to stop right then and just say, it could be worse. When you get home and you walk up to your front door, and you put your hand out to turn the doorknob, and you realize that doorknob is barely hanging on, and that door needs a coat of paint, and the whole house is kind of falling apart, and you look around and think, man, if I just had a better house, if I had a newer house, if I had a nicer house, I want you just to stop and say to yourself, it could be worse. When you wake up tomorrow morning and roll over and look at your spouse, I want you just... <laughs> Don't do it, okay? <laughs> Don't do it. Because they could do it too, okay? <laughs> I mean, the reality is we're always comparing. We're always thinking it could be better when really it could be worse. Here's what the Bible says about this. It is better to be satisfied with what you have than to always be wanting something else. And Hebrews says this, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Here's an assignment for you. When you get home, make a list of every good thing in your life. Start with God, 
And then you better put your family in case they find that list, all right? <laughs> Friends, sunsets, pepperoni pizza, ESPN, barbecue, whatever it is, put it on that list. And as you see all the good things that God has given you, just be grateful for what it is that you have. Here's the last one. Trust in God. Trust that he knows what he's doing. Trust like that song said that the Lord will provide. Paul says it this way in this passage we just read. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret to being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And look at verse 13. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Paul says it again a little differently to to Timothy, his protege. He says this, command those who are rich in this present world. Let me stop you right there. If you think rich is somebody else, did you know if you live on welfare in America, you're doing better than 80% of the world? Rich is just, it's not a number. It's having more than you need. And he says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. I mean, when you look at your financial situation, when you look at all the things that you have, and especially the things that you don't have, there are really just two questions you have to ask yourself. And here's the first one. Is God in charge? Do you really believe that God is in charge? I mean, Jesus had all kinds of teachings where he said, don't worry. Don't worry about what you don't have. Don't worry about wanting more, being, about getting more, being concerned with what you'll get tomorrow because God knows and God cares and God's in control and God's watching and God will provide. We don't think of it this way, but for those of us who are Christians, when we experience discontentment, when we look at what other people have and think it could be better, when we lust and envy over other people's things, then we spend all this time and money pursuing more. Basically what we are saying is, God, you don't know. God, you don't care. God, you're not watching. God, you don't love me. God, you're not going to provide. And so we slowly grab the steering wheel away from God and saying, I got it from here. I'll take care of it from here. Two questions. Is God in charge? And then is God enough? Is that really enough for you? Let me give you a scenario. If you woke up tomorrow morning and learned that there is no money in the bank, no money in retirement, your house is worth nothing, you've got nothing, or you woke up tomorrow and discovered there is no God, which one brings you more anxiety? And what Paul learned was this. When I'm well fed, I have Jesus. When I'm hungry, I still have Jesus. When I have plenty, I still have Jesus. When I'm in want, I still have Jesus. In fact, maybe we could just learn this phrase. No matter what I have, I have enough because he's enough for me. Can we just say that together? No matter what I have, I have enough because he's enough for me. Let's say it like we mean it. No matter what I have, I have enough because he's enough for me. When you begin to zero in on that, you begin to discover that not only is God in charge, but God is enough. And when he asks me to open up my hands and share with other people, when he asks me to bless people that are in need, when he asks me to be a conduit of his resources, I don't have to fear what will happen if I do that. Because I have enough. Because he's enough for me. You know, throughout the course of this series, we're going to walk through three more attitudes, these giveitudes that we all need to have. But I think it really comes down to this first one. Can we learn that God is enough and we're content with that? You know that great feature you have on your, your iPhone where when you take a picture of somebody or something, you have that potential to hit portrait mode. And portrait mode means it's just going to highlight the person that's right in the middle of the picture and kind of blur out everything in the background. You know why some of us are so stressed? Because the thing that's in the center of portrait mode for us is stuff or money 
or things, and Jesus is blurred out in the background. And we're kind of waiting for him to help us get that. What if we switch that around? What if Jesus became our focus? What if Jesus became our priority? And all the stuff and all the things were just blessings he chooses to give when he's ready. And they blur out in the background because he becomes the most important thing. I mean, think about it. When you go through the most difficult times of your life, that's what you really want, isn't it? When you're in the hospital bed, what you won't, don't want is uh, your checkbook next to you. You want to know Jesus is next to you. When your kids are going through difficult times, what you don't need is to know the 401k is good. What you want to know is that Jesus is with you. When you're struggling in your marriage trying to figure things out, what you don't need is all kinds of money for another vacation. What you want to know is Jesus is with you. And when Jesus becomes what's, becomes what's in the portrait, everything else is blurred out in the background and suddenly everything then makes sense. Because I have enough if I have him. So here's my question before we go any further in this series. Do you have him? Have you decided to be a follower of Jesus? Have you given your life over to him? And I want to provide you an opportunity to do that today. Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? For those of you who have never said yes to Jesus, who have never decided to make him the leader and forgiver of your life, would you do that right now? Just quietly right there where you are, between you and Jesus, just say these words after me. Jesus, I'm asking you to be the leader and the forgiver of my life. And I'm giving everything to you. And for those of us who have said that once before, maybe this is your prayer. Jesus, you've been in the background way too much in my life. I want to make you the focus of my life. All the stuff, all the things, all the, the wants, I put that in the background, God. I just want to focus in on Jesus. I want him to be, and following after him to be the most important thing in my life. Jesus, you're first. God, we thank you for the way that you have rescued us from our sins so that we could even pray that prayer. And we celebrate with all those who did. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that for the first time, we do celebrate with you today. And if you would let us know, you can simply text the word Jesus to 55757. That lets us know that you made that decision and we can celebrate with you and tell you some next steps for you. And we're going to take some time right now for us to think about how generous God has been to us by taking communion together. If you have those communion packets, you can take those out right now. If you're watching online at home, you can get something that is uh, the elements that remind you of communion. And let's take a few moments and just remember how good God has been to us by allowing his son to take our place on a cross. Let's take communion at this time.